Hello, welcome to our viewers. Thank you for joining us today in our webinar, Media Workflows in the Work From Home Era, a real, real world demonstration. Joining us today are the same speakers as last time, Doug Soltes, Director of Product Solutions at SME, as well as David Phillips, Principal Architect of Media and Entertainment Solutions at Cloudian. Welcome, David. Welcome, Doug. All right, so last time we were uh, together, we talked about the legacy workflow of media and entertainment, you know, involving a lot of FedEx or file transfers from the acquisition to a central data center, and then obviously taking those assets, trying to figure out how you transfer them, whether that be, again, through FedEx tape delivery out to distribution. And then again, once all that assets are in that central data center, how do you actually interact with that from your end users, both in your office as well as now in this work from home time in a remote solution? That's where last time Doug and Dave talked about the next generation workflow. Leveraging technologies like Cloudian at the core to store all the data in a highly scalable, highly reliable and durable object storage platform. On top of that, the Storage Made Easy platform allowing you and your users to easily go and fix those gaps in the acquisition, the distribution, as well as the workflow uh, using the simple web-based interface that Storage Made Easy provides, the file acceleration through our M-Stream technology, as well as desktop and mobile tools where they make sense in the environment. So that's what we talked about last time from a next generation workflow perspective, obviously just from a uh, you know slide presentation. Uh, but today we're gonna jump deeper in and really show what this looks like in practice. So. Doug, Dave, if you guys can you know, start to show some of this, we can step through and really show and understand this next generation workflow using Storage Made Easy and Cloudian. Sure, Eric. So I, I think we can start off by just saying, you know, hey, I, I think everybody can see the difference between this and our previous Bright Talk or, you know, other uh, webinars out there is that, you know, we're not using a slide deck this time. You, you've got us, you've got the, uh, it looks like a slide, but, you know, now we're, we're live streaming, right? We've, we've got, you know, software like OBS and we are doing, you know, a lot of this through the, the exact mechanisms we talked about last time. So, um, you know, the, the first thing I, I want to bring up is that, you know, the, the workflow is still the same. You need to um, acquire information, or not information. You need to acquire uh, assets. Yeah, so. You need to, you know, store them somewhere. That can be in the cloud, it can be on cloud, and it can be on other storage on premise. And then uh, workers, when they're working from home, need to be able to work on that. They need to be able to collaborate on that. And then, of course, we need to uh, distribute that. And so those were really, you know, the highlights from the, the last webinar. And um, that's what we, we want to show you today, but in a, uh, you know, a whole different flow, uh, the, the actual real world. And so, David, uh, you, you've already started working on a video. Why, why don't you talk about, you know, what they're going to be seeing today, and then we'll just dump right into the, uh, the demo. Right. So, you know, the, the concept, you know, the, uh, for our example workflow, um, you know, comes from something like, uh, you know, a news magazine program where, you have uh, lots of different, you know, kind of remote shooters from, you know, remote locations, could be from around the world, uh, different countries, different, uh, different continents, who are out there, you know, kind of gathering footage, not necessarily breaking news, but, you know, um, a lot of kind of the news magazine style programs, you know, you just need some kind of essentially background B-roll footage, you know, of different locations, you know, you know, be it, you know, be it Asia, you know, um, different parts of North America, Europe, you know, Latin America. So for these, you know, in the, but you still need to kind of, a, uh, you have a fast paced production, you know, you identify uh, remote production teams, um, you give them a kind of mandate of like, this is the kind of footage that we're looking for. Um, and then, you know, you need to provide some sort of access, some sort of way for the, to get the footage uh, back, not ship it in a drive, not like write it off to a data tape, you know, and put it in uh, a courier service, you know, but some is like, how can people contribute, you know, this remote footage, um, you know, to this, to this content creation team. And that's where, you know, the combination of storage made easy with uh, a Cloudian object storage platform um, provides content creators at a really like a media production hub, right? So it's um, both, can scale to multi petabyte level. So n unlike, you know, a lot of cloud service options like Dropbox, Box, Google Drive, 
that are really made for kind of small, you know, project-based data sets, you can combine uh, Storage Made Easy platform with a Cloudian um, storage cluster and store all of your media library, both your historical legacy um, from previous shoots or from, you know, stock footage libraries, stock music, uh, graphics libraries that might span, you know, like years, if not decades, really kind of, once you put it all together, really kind of adds up to a petabyte, you know, multi-petabyte level media library. Um, but so enable these remote workers to access both that, you know, that kind of rich, um, deep media library, but also as a, as a media production hub for uh, ingesting and acquiring this new footage. Yeah, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, one of the, the key aspects of that from the acquisition standpoint is, you know, you want it to be both user friendly as well as expedient in delivering those assets back and forth, right? So, you know, it, it's finding that right technology that fits that gap to so that the people yeah. out in the field can feel like they're easy, just drop folder, drop folders or files into an interface, uh, and then behind the scenes, all the leverage technology to really speed that up so they're not waiting forever for those assets to be delivered. Right. And of course, you know, most importantly, you know, making sure that this is actually a secure system, secure system Absolutely. for delivery, secure system for storage, because, you know, um, a lot of, you know, the kind of uh, file sharing services, you end up having to kind of, uh, you know, extend accounts, you know, or share passwords, you know, between, you know, teams and, you know, quickly becomes essentially uh, you start to compromise your your security procedures, your security pro protocols. So, you know, the great thing about Stores Made Easy is that you can have, you know, your distributed, you know, now your work at home teams in inside the organization who typically have Active Directory accounts and, you know, have that kind of traditional uh, access and, and role based access control. Um, can all kind of maintain all that kind of users and group permissions. And then third parties, you know, can be, you can extend temporary, uh, you know, kind of third party access for, again, for these kind of contract workers and, and, um, and kind of remote consultants. So David, why don't we uh, switch to your environment and uh, you can walk us through, you know, what, what's already set up and what our next step is. Sure. All right, David, so what are we, uh, we seeing? It looks like a photo gallery inside the uh, Enterprise File Fabric. Yeah, so th this is a, a view of the, um, the environment that we're you know, using for this demonstration. So on the left-hand side here, I've got my Cloudian, uh, what's labeled the Cloudian Media Hub. So this would be the you know, kind of central uh, data center uh, you know, meet rich media library, which again could be scaled up to the multi multi petabyte level without, you know, in a, in a very kind of cost effective and easily scalable way, um, and that you know might hold you know all of my sound effects library, stock footage library, um, stock photos. In this example, I've got a um, stock photo folder full of uh, kind of archival photos of New York City, you know, and the, which I can kind of do a browse and search across. I can kind of get a thumbnail browse, or if I'm looking for something specific, I can use search terms. And then I've also got a essentially a shared files, uh, a Cloudium bucket that is essentially um, incorporated with Storage Made Easy as a, here's my shared uh, files, here's my kind of location for uh, users to uh, trade and collaborate and kind of all, get, all be able to kind of access the same group of files no matter where they are, if they're in the office or if they're anywhere that they can access, you know, um, the internet with a web browser. So um, this is the kind of, uh, you know, capability that, you know, having essentially um, where I can look at and browse and search my storage from anywhere, and also I can kind of quickly upload and download. If I'm working at home and I want to uh, kind of pull files, you know, from a from a stock photos library, um, I can I can download those and 
storage made easy using the mstream technology is going to accelerate that to try to get the best out of my internet bandwidth so here you can exactly. see and go ahead no no I, I was saying exactly um and so then what, what are we looking at here so you, you've already started the uh the project we'll be working on today right so this is uh, an example of here i've got um you know some footage uh, from, you know, that a contributor in uh, Seoul, Korea, time-lapse footage of a, a sunset um, from Seoul, Korea. I've got some other footage that um, someone shot in Manila, Manila, Philippines. And then I've got uh, some footage from um, Minneapolis, St. Paul here. So I've got, uh, and I've also, you know, working with a, a another graphics artist, who is a you know uploaded all of these lower thirds graphics so you know this is kind of the you know in a nutshell um very kind of short project distributed team but i could have you know like uh you know a music a sound designer a music composer who was contributing um you know the audio um tracks uh graphics designer doing motion graphics and lower thirds and then remote shooters who are contributing this kind of uh, atmospheric B-roll footage from uh, around the world. So I've got a gap here at the beginning. I've got a lower say, third. Yeah, I, yeah. I, had, uh, I had some, some you know, clips to contribute to you. Now, you know, uh, obviously you, you could give me a, um, you know, AD LDAP SAML account into your, your system there. But since yeah. I'm not somebody that normally works with you, why don't you just create a, uh, if you go back a shared link or folder somewhere, shoot that over to me and, uh, you know, I will share the uh, the clips that you wanted. I had some B-roll and I, I broke uh, three sections out that I think were, were probably the best. Okay, okay. Right, so in this yeah. use case, we can imagine that Doug is, you know, a contractor or somebody else in the field, you know, a, a, a freelance photographer that is doing this work. And again, we don't want to give him necessarily control to uh, get into the Cloudian storage, you know, to that asset library, but instead leverage Storage Made Easy to create these shared links that then allow Doug, as the freelancer, to upload just the videos that are required. Um, and we can watch that that flow go now. So yeah. Yep. And, create that and this is land directly on this cloud and storage, which, which is, you know, pretty neat. With, with other solutions out there, you know, if you upload data to, you know, a Google Drive account or something, you, you don't get to pick the storage. So David, it looks like in this case, you've got a bucket, you've, you've picked your bucket, you're creating a, a folder, I guess in S3 terms, you call it a, a prefix. And um, you're controlling where the, the flow of the data will go. And SMEs ain't control the acceleration, the security. So uh, yeah, now, now if you just uh, up above, if you um, uh, click on the folder above it. And uh, yep, there you go, switch view. Perfect. And then share by URL. Uh, yeah, not team share. So, so do that again, click uh, share and share by URL. There you go. And then, uh, so, so now what we're seeing are some of the options. Now I need to put the data in there right away. So if you want to send expiration on this for you know an hour from now, you know, feel free. And that way you're sure that nobody else will, you know, use this link. Um, and then if you put in a, a simple password and, uh, you know, send that over to me in our, our chat bar, I will uh, upload you the, the files you'd requested. All right, David, so I got that link from you in the uh, chat bar, and I am going to uh, go ahead and paste this in Chrome. I could use any browser I wanted. And uh, you said that we had used our standard password, so I'm gonna enter that in from my password manager. And I am not gonna save that password. So it looks like you created a folder for me called Doug, it's all empty. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into uh, the, the folder with the files I wanted. And I can actually just click and drag this entire folder or all the files. But one thing I did want to demonstrate is our mStream technology. The mStream technology at Storage Made Easy accelerates all file transfers. And that can be uploads or downloads. It can be uh, via the browser. It can be between two different storage media. So those could be two types of on-premise storage, like a cloud and a store next. It can be between uh, a cloud storage platform like Google or Amazon or, or Microsoft's clouds and something like your cloudy on-premise. Really, 
you know, any way we go, if the API supports some sort of acceleration, uh, we do it. When we're talking about the browser, there's two different ways that we can accelerate data. Uh, one is to move smaller files in parallel. So you can see that most of the, the files I split out for you, they're all around 10 megabytes. Um, but the, the actual B-roll that has all of the, the the, the raw stock footage is a gig. So if I just dump this entire thing in the folder, what would happen is the B-roll will be broken into multiple simultaneous pieces. The other ones will be moved probably one at a time. The browser I'm using, Chrome, can only handle uh, four simultaneous uploads um, at a time for, for our M-Stream technology. So what I do is just to demonstrate that, I'm first I move the, uh, the, the four small ones, so you can see those going in parallel. So what you're seeing here is them being uploaded in parallel, and let me make the screen a little bit smaller because you've got the, uh, the bandwidth over there on the right. And so you can see that it copied all four of those in parallel. Um, and then likewise, if, if I had also dragged in this file, or now if I dra drag it individually, mstream, because this is a larger file, so a one gigabyte file, mstream, they say, well, that's a bigger file. Instead of moving it or other files in parallel, I'm going to use some of my um, threads to break this into pieces. So because we're not moving any other files, and I know my browser can do four simultaneous streams, when I bring this in, we're gonna see four simultaneous streams of data. And the way we're gonna see that, well, actually we've got a, uh, a nice little overlay right there. Um, let me just break that out for you so it's a little cleaner. So we have the uh, the speed, we have how many total parts um, it's sending right now. So it's going to break this into eight parts total. Right now it's sending four of those parts. And the, the bandwidth is honestly going to be dependent on your, um, you know, the, the speed in which I can send. Um, I'm sending from a lab right now. I think maybe I have a 100 megabit capability and um, I don't know where your, your, your cloud is located. But what MStream's doing is it's just handling all the complexity. It's breaking it into the streams, just like it did when I moved the smaller files. It's doing the same kind of thing for the, uh, the bigger file. But we don't need to wait for this to be done to, to now go ahead and start working you know, on the files I thought were more important for you to go ahead and include, as long as you trust my judgment that these are the, the better files to use for the lower thirds. Yeah, and actually, before you move on, Doug, just a quick question on this. So, you know, is there a special add-on or plugin required or Flash or Java or anything like that required for this to work? So, no, when you're using the browser for uploads, uh, we can do four simultaneous streams without a, uh, a plugin. When, when we're talking about downloads, uh, you do need a plugin. So we have a small plugin called uh, Cloud Edit. What Cloud Edit does is uh, not only could it handle um, the acceleration for a download, but say I was working on a Word file or an Excel file or, or one of these you know, movie files, I'd be able to double click it, work on it, and then save it back. Now, when you work on a raw file, you're not going to actually edit the original, but you can imagine if you're working on a, uh, a Word document or a PowerPoint and you double click it, if you're using some other system like Dropbox, what it's saying do is it's saying copy it down, saying save to your local you know, system, you're going to work on it, and then it's up to you to save it back up instead of just hitting the save button. Alternatively, what you're going to see David using is we uh, we have a technology called Drive. We have Drive for Mac, Windows, and Linux. And with Drive, if you install that application in Windows, it mounts uh, your SME storage as a Drive letter. And so you'll see all of your data, all of your shares um, as like a, a T drive or an S drive or whatever drive letter or letters you want it to correspond to. In Mac or Windows, that's, that's going to be, uh, I'm sorry, Mac or Linux, that's going to be a mount point instead. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and key to that, again, is, you know, if we think about this workflow as acquisition where you're not creating AD accounts for users and you're giving these links out to people, you don't have to worry about what browser they're using, if they've downloaded the right plugins, right? It'll just work on anything, so. It'll just work, and you know, the um, for the most part, for most people working from home, four simultaneous streams is going to be enough. But when you actually use the SME tools or the agents, um, you know, you can exceed those four simultaneous streams. But um, it, it depends on where you're working from. If you're working from the office and you actually were, were working with another office, then maybe you do want eight simultaneous streams of data because maybe they have a, a gig pipe. Okay, makes sense. Thanks. All right, David, so uh, why don't you uh, switch back, take control, and uh, guide us to the next step of the process. All right, can everybody see my screen here? Yes. Yeah, so it looks like uh, you've got those files. Now that you hit refresh, you've got my B-roll, plus you've got um, a number of the, uh, the smaller proxies that I thought would be useful in including. Yeah, so in the, you know, the 
I think the key thing here is like, okay, you know, every, I think everybody kind of understands it's like storage made easy, gives me a web interface for looking and browsing and searching for media and for also transferring, uploading and downloading media. But how do I actually get it into my, um, out into my project? And that's where, you know, the um, storage made easy has a kind of uh, technology called cloud drive, which is essentially allows me to mount my collection of storage uh, made easy storage pools, my cloud in my NAS, my, you know, my sand could be different, um, different vol storage volumes, you know, uh, and collects all those and I can mount all that as a drive letter on my Windows system here. So if I go into the Doug folder, um, I see I can essentially, this is the file that I'm gonna use for the opening of the piece, this New York City video. Um, I'm gonna import that. And because this is this cloud uh, drive is essentially cached that, uh, you know, that storage made easy, you know, file locally on my local SSD, I can, you know, this is an HD file, but I can scrub through it and play it in real time. So this is the, um, this is the file that I want to incorporate into my project. I'm just gonna trim the, uh, trim the heads and tails down here a little bit and drop it in, gonna undo that. And now, once again, if I go and I say reveal um, where this file is, uh, reveal and explore, even though this is, you know, on, on my Cloudia Median Hub, this is my shared files folder, I'm able to, you know, play it back in real time, um, an HD, play it back in HD file because it's cached it locally. Right, that clouding could be essentially anywhere in the world. You know, I, I just simply got your link, I dragged it, I clicked it. You know, that could be, I'm, I'm in California, that clouding could be in New York, it could be in London, it could be absolutely anywhere, and you could be anywhere as well. And, you know, that's one of the points of this webinar. I think uh, somebody in the last webinar said, you know, we'd run a little long, questions were out there, but somebody said, hey, you know, isn't object storage like Cloudian? not super performant, you know, I, I guess they're used to using an SSD or a NAS that's based on SSDs, and that can be really expensive, um, but I think you really highlighted it there in that, you know, the, the cloud in is your pool, it's all your, your, your storage, it's all the photos, but using the SME drive, you know, that's being cached to a uh, SSG drive that you have attached to your laptop, so you are getting the performance, but you're not paying the, the big dollars, right? Right. And the other benefit is that, you know, you don't have this issue where people are copying files, they're, they're like copying files locally. I have my local copies of files and then I upload like a new copy of files and you have all this kind of data and copy management issues. Whereas like this is, I'm really just, you know, there's a central, you know, uh, master version of the file and I'm just caching a copy locally. And then I can use that to essentially do the next step, which is, now that I've got my completed project here, I've got all of my graphics, my video, my audio, I want to now output it for, I'm gonna create essentially uh, an, you know, an MPEG-4 to send around to the you know, broader team for review and approval. So at this point, I want to output um, my timeline here. All right, so now that I finished exporting my timeline from Premiere, um, I can go double check. I can see that I see it in Cloud Drive and the uh, final output folder. Finished, Premiere's finished writing the file there. So I verify that. So now if I go into the Storage Made Easy web interface, I can double check, make sure that I okay, see in my final output folder that Cloud Drive has finished uploading uh, this MPEG-4. Uh, I can even pull up the video player, do a quick video preview of it, scrub through the video, make sure I've got picture, I've got sound, everything looks good. Excellent, so now I'm ready to share it out. 
select the file, click the share button, and I'm going to set a password on it. At this point, I can create a new link, copy that to my clipboard. I can paste that into a text app, messaging app. Um, I can paste you it can into Slack an email. it, email it, however yeah. you like. I can, I can basically, anybody that I pass the link and who has, a, um, has the password can access uh, the, the video. Right, and and if you know people watch our part one, they know that we also have an audit log, and that you know every time that's accessed now, we're going to know, you know, who touched it, their IP address. Um, in fact, we have even more complex auditing if you want, where you have to give out a reason for sharing and who you're sharing with. But you know, right now you have basic sharing on, which which allows you to, you know, password protected, which is. To be honest, all most people want because everything we're right. doing right now is via HTTPS. It's all, you know, um, TLS 1.2 and AES 256 encrypted. Great. Hey, one last thing that I'd like to bring up is, uh, you know, the producer, sometimes when they download it, they want to make sure that the MD5 sum is the same or, or they might want some media info on it. So one of the features that we have in uh, Storage Made Easy, you don't need to transcode this because it's already in a web format, but if you uh, right-click that file right now, you should be able to do something called content extraction. And so if you perform content, I'm sorry, content intelligence, and what content intelligence is, is, is uh, go ahead and click it. It's a, uh, a uh, as to what content intelligence is, is it's our ability to mine the file or the media asset for more information. In this case, in your lab, we have the setup to pull out the MD5 sum and to pull out the media info. We'll put them into our own database as information, but we'll also put them as sidecar files. And the benefit of having them as uh, sidecar files is that then you could share those also as files. So if somebody downloaded that file, they'd know what the, uh, the MD5 sum is. They'd be able to see uh, the media information for it because maybe they didn't know it was an H264 instead of an H265. And so right there, if you click that, you got it there, your two sidecars. And those are going to be on your storage. Obviously, Cloudy has the ability to save metadata, but a lot of, uh, you know, systems like whether that's your, your NAS file or your, you know, file system mount or Dropbox don't have the capability of adding metadata in. And so, uh, we save them as sidecars um, so that they're just universally usable. Uh, we have deeper ties into things like Google's Cloud. So if you actually want to send that out to Google's Cloud and get their um, you know, their intelligence on it, it'd be able to pick out tags, it'd be able to pick out scenes. Um, if that was somebody talking, it'd be able to do a uh, text-to-speech or, or subtitle transcoding. So um, there's a number of features that we have there, but you know, the one that you've got set on your system right there is probably the most popular other than our new transcoding. Uh, transcoding is really only going to be applicable when you're not dealing with something like an H.264 uh, type of file. Right, dealing with uh, kind of large, you know, four, potentially 4K files, you know, camera, camera, different camera formats or high res mezzanine format. So, Eric, at this point, I hope uh, Dave and I have walked you through, uh, you know, what we talked about in the last webinar. Um, I, I'm guessing that we have questions from the, you know, panel that you can go check out. But in the meantime, do you have uh, any questions for us or do you want to just go check the panel? No, no, I. I just want to say thank you guys. Uh, that was a great presentation. It was good to see, you know, in practice that workflow that we talked about a couple weeks ago, you know, both from the, the asset side, how do you deliver those assets in a easy manner, uh, in a quick manner from the field now into your central media hub, as Dave called it, right? And then now that those assets are in there, right, how do you easily go and interact with that in your native tools? And and we saw David work in, uh, you know, his, his Adobe Premiere, um, using the ex cloud drive just like he would in the office, right? So no, no need to retrain the people. Uh, and then finally, now that the the clip is all edited, send it off to me as the producer for me to review, and you know we can see that full life cycle uh, using storage made easy and using Cloudy. And so that's great. Thanks. So uh, as mentioned, we have definitely a bunch of comments or questions, I should say. Uh, so let's start with is for uh, Doug. Uh, okay. It says, uh, will file fabric work well with a quantity of data that a media business needs. So why don't you talk a little bit about the, you know, footprint, I guess probably much the same as what, we're gonna come back to Cloudian side, but from SME side, how do we sure. deal with that? 
Sure. So, uh, you know, we, we work with media customers, we work with law firms, we work with, you know, healthcare. Uh, we have different instances that have, um, you know, ingested uh, a petabyte worth of data, you know, um, a, a billion plus files. One of the things that, that you have to remember is that we're, we're literally just the metadata in front. So we're not actually, uh, one thing that we didn't highlight in this video, but we did highlight uh, last time we talked was that we never alter your data. So when a file comes into us and we deliver it on Cloudian, we didn't proprietize that file. You can go directly to Cloudian, you can pull that file back out. And so because we don't proprietize any data, it means that you know we don't have these giant metadata libraries of different fragments and pieces and, and things like that. So you know, realistically, we're probably talking about 1K a file that we're keeping uh, of metadata per file. Now, of course, you saw at the end there that we could do um, advanced content extraction for, for certain types of files like media files and whatnot. And so, you know, that MD5 sum is obviously less than a K, but that media info was maybe 4K more of data. Um, and that's why we keep some of it in our database, but for the most part, we load it as a sidecar file. Um, so yeah, I, I you know, the, the only spot where I think I'd be a little worried is if you had an, an, an animator, sometimes they have really small files and like, you know, 10 billion of them or, or something like that. But, you know, we'd certainly be good for any of the, the end clips and whatnot, but, you know, storing every single individual model um, may or may not be the, 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 you know, best one. Yeah, yeah, d definitely important to look at the, the workload in the use case. But I think, you know, at, at a high level, we've got customers running with, you know, terabyte plus size files on the system. Oh yeah. You know, billions of files and objects. So, you know, it works quite well for at, at scale. Um, so David, I think we have your audio now. So, so back to you yeah. and the question was, you know, realistically, how much data can be stored on, on a Cloudian installation? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we like to categorize Cloudian as, um, you know, infinitely scalable um, just because there's no inherent limits because it is a, you know, a distributed system that where you can just keep adding nodes uh, and increasing the capacity, um, increasing the availability and the, even the performance of the whole storage cluster. Um, you know, we have customers who have hundreds of petabytes of, uh, you know, media assets or genomics data, things like that. Um, and that it can be comprised of essentially billions of objects. You know, we, we support essentially, you know, the round number of billion objects, you know, like per bucket, right? So um, in, in, in real world terms, we don't really consider ourselves having storage limits. Um, it's really just about, about how, much, how much rack space you have in your data center, you know, things like that, or, you know, we have customers who have multiple data centers because we support the same web scale uh, architecture designs where I can have a, you know, a rack, you know, in multiple racks in a data center and then multiple data centers in a region. And it's all essentially in one single storage domain. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, all right. So the next one we got is uh, back to Doug. Um, does the file fabric know that it's dealing with media assets or is it just a bunch of files to the software? So for the most part, I would say 95% of the operations consider it just to be a bunch of files, right? We can take in any file. It, it could be an ISO, right? So maybe um, you've got your, you know, Red Hat installation ISO and you want to right click it and you want to say, hey, give me the MD5 sum of this. You know, you, you can. Um, obviously, you're not going to be able to transcode it and you're not going to be able to send it up to Google and those libraries. So we do have a, a certain number of features in the content intelligence that specifically look for a, a type of file like an MLV. You know, you, you can't do a media extraction or something like that. Um, you know, the gallery view specifically looks for a, a number of type of image files, whether they're raw or they're Sony format or whatnot. Um, you know, when David first jumped in the environment, he had had the, the full preview, uh, that preview is adjustable and whatnot. But, um, and then lastly, I had talked a, a little bit about Cloud Edit. And um, Cloud Edit by default would allow you to pull down a, a media file quickly. And again, it, it's probably not something you're going to then try to edit because you know that, that's just not what you do with a, a master copy. Uh, you'd use our drive. But if you had, say, a Photoshop file that you actually were looking to edit, um, you, you need to go into Cloud Edit and say, hey, I, I would like to alter this type of file. But uh, for the most part, you know, we can deal with any type of file. We can move them around. You can use the system for both your home drives and, you know, your Word, Excel. You can put scripts in it. You can do workflows. You can collaborate. And you can manage your entire media practice remotely. 
Excellent. Cool. All right, let's sort of let's go bounce back and forth. So the next one, uh, back to David. Uh, what makes Cloudian storage better than just going out and using a public cloud storage service? Right, and you know it, it's it's kind of a common question, and it really um, comes down to you know your specific organization's uh, you know workflow needs and other you know considerations like you know well, how much data center space do you have do you even have a data center so it really is geared towards you know the uh, you know essentially customer profile where they have they have on prem um, you know tier one storage they need essentially some sort of secondary storage target a, an expandable scalable pool of secondary storage that can provide a you know a complement for kind of backup and archive of from that tier one storage, um, but also just as can act as we're kind of went through in this webinar, a central media storage hub that can be accessible. It's scalable on prem, and but it's also accessible anywhere via the S3 API and things like the SME uh, interface. So, you know, it really comes down to, you know, there is cost benefits for a large media library that is stored for a long term, you know, stored, you know, if, if these are valuable assets that are being stored for, you know, not just, you know, three years and five years, but, you know, 10 years and even 50 years, we have customers, you know, in news and sports and entertainment who have their own large legacy archives and the multi, multi petabyte level um, of scale. Uh, storing that in the public cloud over those long periods of time um, is not cost effective. It's, it's you know, we, we have a, a, you know, tremendous cost advantage over that. Um, so it really, you know, there are advantages to, you know, public cloud services or stored services like Dropbox and that they are um, very, for small data sets, relatively, they're easy to start up with and they're easy to, uh, you know, they're relatively inexpensive. Um, where clouding comes in is, is when you get to those those kind of larger scales, where you know like hundred you know not just hundreds of petabytes you know let's say greater than a hundred petabytes up into the um, hundreds of terabytes up into the petabytes of flow. One, one thing I'll throw in just because you know I know this came up on a. Uh, a POC that I worked on with, with David not too long ago is, um, you know, a lot of people in the, the media business um, are intolerant to any type of failure, you know, if they're doing some sort of live broadcasting and, and whatnot. So, you know, if you're if you're a uh, smaller shop and you're, you're doing feature length films and all that, that's different. But what they brought up was, um, you know, uptime failure. And, and so when you have a cloudy and has high availability, so this is a public cloud, don't get me wrong. But, you know, there are a number of things that can go wrong between your office location and that public cloud, whether that's your internet link, you know, them, um, uh, denial of service attacks, things like that, how much, you know, bandwidth, e extra latency. And so, you know, they, they're going to use this as a tiering strategy. Um, one thing we didn't bring up in the, the video is that, you know, Cloudian um, can, can also tier to, to different clouds. Um, so you can use, a, you know, public clouds as, as a cache. But, um, you know, if you have everything on premise, you kind of have, um, in, in some ways, the ability for higher availability. You take some risk out. Yeah, and I think another key aspect to, to, to what you're saying, Doug, is that, again, because it's on-prem in your data center and it's on your 10 gig, 25 gig, 100 gig network, um, you have essentially this unlimited, you know, whatever all of your available bandwidth on your local network that you're not being charged for the egress fees um, you're not being charged for the bandwidth costs um, so you know to answer come back around to the to the question you know why why use cloudian over um, a public cloud service number one cost can be a factor um, performance can be a factor and then because it's on-prem behind your firewall you know, you have complete control over the security profile. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, guys. Um, all right, next question. Actually, this is a quick one. I, I, I can tackle it. Um, so, uh, is there anything like Cloud Drive for our Linux machines? Uh, so, yes. Um, the File Fabric uh, from the desktop tool side supports Mac, Windows, and Linux. On the Linux side, we're just using basically a fuse mount uh, to create a mounted location uh, that talks to the APIs to access that data. 
you know, the other uh, tools that we have available as well are also mobile. So iOS and Android apps are available. You know, not to say that you would have people doing editing of those uh, assets on their mobile devices. Um, but in the scenario where we talked about where, for example, you know, I'm a producer and I get the link to view uh, that, that, you know, raw footage or, or the dailies or whatnot, you know, potentially I could do that right from my phone, you know, click the link, it will download, it'll be able to play back in my native video viewers on my local device. So, you know, hey, depending can, on, you know, where your uh, users are, we have tools that can meet you there. Can, can I throw in one thing there? So uh, generally yeah. when I work with healthcare or, or uh, media entertainment, and they're talking about Linux. I haven't seen a ton of people with Linux, Linux desktop. So uh, to your point, we absolutely have the tool they can use and everything like that. Linux also often comes up when they're talking about say transcoding or, or they're doing genomics or something like that. And so if you're transcoding, you have a, a Linux machine that's running Vantage, it's running FFmpeg, it's running Amberfin, whatever, whatever it's running. Um, you, you can, as we show, have a cache. You can use our software to pull it directly from Cloudian, you know, transcode it on that and, and then send it back. Um, alternatively, what, what we've seen in a number of um, shops is they already have some type of um, shared NAT storage. And so what those machines are doing is they're just looking for a certain folder. Once something's dropped in that folder, they automatically execute it or, or they're, it, it's dropped with a like a sidecar file that, that's the, the execution. And so in that case, the way that you would use our software is maybe not to install that on those Linux uh, systems, but to keep your current workflow and to use our software to move data from Cloudian to that NAS and then when it's done to move it back. So th there's two different ways to tackle that. Obviously we don't know um, what, what somebody was thinking of when they, they posed that question, but there's two different angles that depending on if we're talking server or, or user use case. Yeah, thanks. Uh, all right, so David, um, so it seems like object storage platforms are all the same. Uh, what's so special about Cloudia? Yeah, okay. I think, you know, Sure. The, you know, I think one of the key differentiators uh, for our platform is that, um, number one, it's, it's a software-defined storage platform. That means that you can deploy it um, on a variety of different hardware storage servers. Um, we sell appliances that's a bundle of hardware and software, but, you know, we also are certified with HP, Lenovo, Cisco. Um, we have customers running on Supermicro. Um, so that flexibility and that you're not locked into a specific hardware vendor, um, you know, we're just, you can use whatever commodity storage hardware you, uh, you want and would meet your requirements be it our appliances or sourced by yourself. Um, so, you know, that flexibility, the flexibility of being able to scale from very small, we can start from as small as three nodes and then scale to, you know, like hundreds of nodes and all the kind of, uh, you know, multi petabyte, you know, ranges that we are, have been talking about. I think the other key differentiator is our native S3 API implementation. And that really, especially comes in um, in sophisticated workflows that we you find in M&E where, you know, I wanna do just, I've got like a long, you know, multi-hour recording, a large object, multiple uh, tens of gigabytes. I just wanted to clip 15 seconds of it, you know. So we work with, you know, lots of different, you know, uh, MAM vendors that can use the, the native S3 API calls of doing a, a byte range read request, you know, to be able to clip a small piece of a large, a large object. Which are, that kind of advanced, you know, native S3 API functionality um, is, you know, what we is find is, you know, really differentiates us in the market. We have a high degree of interoperability, you know, with other different software vendors in the uh, in the media space. Excellent, thanks. Uh, all right, back to Doug. So, um, okay, so, so obviously when we showed our demo, we were showing ingesting data through shared links and things like that. But this question is, uh, what about assets that don't arrive at the storage through the file fabric? How can they be incorporated into this workflow? Yep, so, um you know, what we didn't show was that, again, we, we don't touch the file, everything's native. So if, if you have a, a Cloudian system and it's got, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of files on it, you just point us at it and then we walk it, uh, we walk those buckets or whatever you want us to walk, and we can ingest data and metadata at thousands of files a, a second. Now, we, we don't 
then say, well, you, you have to do everything in and out of the file fabric. If you have applications like we talked about before, like David said, that, that natively speak S3, uh, they don't need to, to talk to us. They can keep talking S3 against that bucket. And we have multiple mechanisms where we can uh, keep up to date with that. So, you know, obviously very expensive. We, we could do a full walk, but with something like Cloudian, we can also tie into SQS, which is a notification. We can do it with Amazon and some of the other clouds. You know, each different system has different ways that we can be notified of new metadata coming in or out. Um, and even ones that don't have something like that, we have what we call real-time mode, which is when a user goes to browse the data, we do a call out to the storage and we just verify that what they're seeing is a accurate um, view of the, the information. So um, no, you, you know, when you talk about other gateways on the market, and again, File Fabric's not a gateway, we work with plenty of gateways, but I know that there's sometimes confusion because they proprietize data. And if you want to work with them, all your data has to be ingested through them. And so you could have a bunch of data on a NetApp, you decide that you wanna go cloudy and you put some sort of uh, gateway like like the old Avers in front of uh, a cloudy and, and now you gotta, you gotta suck all of your data in through the NetApp and, and, and change it. And then it's in a proprietary form, so, so you're locked in. Uh, but, you know, we don't yeah. do any of that. And I think that, you know, one of the key, so uh, Source Made Easy is essentially an index in place platform, you know, and, you know, while you probably don't, you know, describe yourself as a media asset management system, the difference between storage made easy and, you know, this index in place um, method is that it doesn't become a bottleneck to, to all that kind of all those different, um, you know, kind of in file ingest, you know, S3 API ingest. Um, it doesn't, you know, SME doesn't become a blocker to all that. It just, indexes all of the indexes the metadata of all the storage volumes in place you know without proprietizing it or or being a kind of in data path blocker to it excellent all right well i think that just about does the questions so uh, i would like to thank both david uh, and doug for their time today uh, as well as you and our audience for joining us and finding out more about uh, the media workflow in the work from home era that's all for today doug david thanks again Thank you, Eric. Thanks, right. Eric.